maybe as a master actuary who uh, provides awards and scholarships to encourage um, improvement in this area, could you perhaps kick off with your comments on what you've heard and the broadly the more more broadly the challenges that, that you see in this case? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, good evening everybody. My name is Peter Thompson. I'm the Master of the Worshipful Company of Actuaries. Uh, for those of you who don't know, actuaries are uh, mathematicians who uh, do the, the number crunching behind primarily pensions, or in, uh, in my case pensions, or life insurance, or things like that. I'm sure you all know that, but just to put it in context. Uh, as the master of the livery company, we also run a charity, uh, and we devote a lot of the resources of the charity to maths education, uh, in particular trying to encourage those who have an interest in maths to be able to develop it further uh, and try to encourage those from whatever background uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, ethnic background, educational background, social background if they have an interest and an aptitude to get involved uh, further. Uh, I listened with uh, great interest to Conrad's uh, presentation um, uh, I mean actuaries are sort of by the nature of things, good at maths, okay, if you to take that for uh, most of us have degrees in maths, as I do, um, and actuaries, if you know any, uh, I know at least one person out there is an actuary, uh, you will know that not only are we good at maths, we actually enjoy it. <laughs> so I, I do get um, extremely irritated when um, educated, middle-class people like John Humphreys, uh, who you'll have heard uh, say probably the Today programme, make it uh, seem amusing that he actually is really bad at maths. I don't think it's amusing at all, and I can't believe that he is as bad at maths as he wrecked he is. Um, I entirely agree with what um, Conrad was saying about starting with pro problem-solving and a problem-centred approach. So if you're learning about trigonometry, it's, whilst it might be interesting to me uh, to draw a triangle and say, look, the sign is this over this, isn't that interesting? Uh, but it's probably a little more interesting to say, if I'm standing here and that building is over there, can I, is there a way I can work out roughly how tall it is? And obviously one of the possibilities is just to Google the name of the building. <laughs> <laughs> There are other ways that involve maths, and that's, if you like, a problem-solving way. Um, the, um, one of the other things that we talk about a lot, uh, and as actuaries we probably would, is the area of not just education in maths, but financial education, uh, which is a bit of a bugbear because it's in that sort of area where the I'm not really very good at maths, isn't it funny, approach to life leads to people being misled missold, misdirected, uh, defrauded and all those sort of things where you, if you look at it you would, from any sort of education and you think what this person has said to you cannot possibly be true and if you had a bit more problem solving background you would know that that could not possibly be true or would be hugely improbable. So a point I wrote down during the, the course of the, the talk was uh, that yes, computers can lead, but they can also mislead. Uh, and in the wrong hands, they can be programmed to mislead. And if it becomes a question of someone that is of, of ill intent leading someone who is actually not very well informed, that's when bad decisions uh, and malpractice occur. Perhaps I'll stop at that point and let my fellow panelists. Uh, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Ros, Ros Reeves, perhaps you could introduce yourself and just explain your interest in STEM. Yeah, girls and that side of things. Thank you. So I am industry, industry, industry in terms of background. So Exxon, uh, Tatum Lyle Group, ICI, Diageo, Smith and Nephew. For those of you who know all of those companies, you'll think what a strange thing to have gone across sectors. That's because my background is maths, physics, engineering, um, and then into change management um, and everything around that area. So culminating in a chief operating officer, more recently moved into a plural career. But I'm also Deputy Chair of Southampton University, and many of you will know that it's a very, very strong university from an engineering viewpoint, including maths and physics. I'm also helping the government with some work to try and encourage 14 to 16 year olds to take maths and science, specifically maths and physics, 
at GCSE and on to A level and beyond. So very, very connected to the area that we're talking about. Hugely excited about actually meeting Conrad. Um, <laughs> um, because I, I think what you're doing is game changing and it's so important. And to take your point about girls, it's so sad that girls actually don't get involved enough in maths and physics because it creates just the most fabulous uh, opportunities. The work I'm doing with the CBI at the moment says we currently have 40,000 vacancies for STEM subjects, many of them maths, in industry, and that number will become 200,000 by 2010. So, sorry, by 2020. So, as management consultants, many of you, and actually as students, many of you, my goodness, does the world need you. For me, one of the really important points is another one that you made, which is that if you go back to when I was first in industry, marketing needed, ma needed uh, English, and it needed art, and it needed perhaps a bit of psychology. Nowadays, what marketing needs is maths. It needs analytics. It needs project management. It needs a way of fundamentally defining a problem <coughs> and then actually collecting the data, using the computer to analyze the data, to bring out insights and implications <coughs> so that we can do things completely differently. So for me, what you're doing is absolutely spot on. I can see the problem, I can do the work to try to encourage or be involved in the work to encourage youngsters, particularly girls, to take maths and physics. But it isn't the right curriculum. It isn't the inspiring subject. Like you, I enjoyed maths. But that's not the case for so many. And the point that we're all making about it's okay to go around saying I don't do maths. Who goes around saying I don't do English? It just wouldn't happen. So why is it acceptable? So absolutely aligned with you. Great, well, thank you. Ross, thank you very much. John, John Leefield, Master of the Educators Company and past master of other companies, for instance. Yes, I'm past master of uh, the information technologies. Uh, I enjoyed maths at school, but such is the nature of our, the way we educate people. I got into a different silo. I was a classicist, at Oxford, but I've been in IT all my work in life and uh, got very interested in education. Um, Ross said something, she said, what you're doing, Conrad, is game changing. I take you back to what you said about Steve Jobs, it should be game changing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so sure at the moment, mm -hmm. in this country, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, I've, I've got quite involved in education in various ways. Um, I'm deeply involved in the, the University of Warwick, which has got quite a good master department and quite a good engineering department. And uh, after a conversation with Baker, with his U UTC, his new type of school, to bring uh, the real world of engineering and some into schools, persuaded Warwick to get involved in setting up a school joined with some engineering companies, one of which is Jaguar Land Rover, one of which is National Grid, and so on. Um, to try to make the academic uh, stuff we were doing part of the real world. My own school was a very academic school in Oxford, and it's very, very good, but not part of the real world. I had a, a symptom of perhaps some success one day Lord Nash, who's one of the ministers for schools, visited my school in uh, Associated with Warwick University. And he was rather cynical about what he called vocational education, real world stuff. Um, and I was quite keen to show him, actually, what we need. Um, we approached a classroom where maths was being taught. And by coincidence, just as the door opened, and I brought him in, there was a huge round of applause from the students. And it was because a lecturer had been talking about maths, he was using it in, in uh, explaining the solution of engineering problems in aspects of Jaguar car. And suddenly those particular boys who were finding maths pretty tough found it quite exciting. And uh, to me that, in a way, is the sort of thing I'm going to say. And that, to me, it, it's an un I get involved in lots of schools, but through the educators and my own personal interests. You don't see that very often in this country. So you talk
talk to a minister, I think John uh, Lord Nash got quite a shock to see children uh, applauding somebody teaching maths. Yeah. <coughs> Why is right outside his field of experience? Um, and my own, my own school is a wonderful school, but it doesn't do much. Anymore. My concern is, how do we make the, the uh, hood, if we were able to do it, into the ears? Because it's hard work persuading <coughs> politicians, persuading the Department of Education, that this is what we should be doing. That um, the history of maths should now be history. And that we, uh, maths should be what should be the future. If I can put it that way, um, the future of the real world. So I found what you had to say more than music to my ends. I just hope we can turn the uh, poet into, into an end. Yeah. John, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for your comments. Um, perhaps we could um, invite those who have been listening to ask the panel or comment indeed about what's been said so far. Um, anyone? Care to put their hand up and go first. Come on. Yes? Right? Courage. Could you say who you are as you stand? Right, sorry, uh, Corinne um, I'm a living room, but I'm actually an accountant. I did do maths uh, as a degree. Um, I, I actually was very lucky that I actually went, when I was doing um, my O levels, I had a very good teacher who actually made maths very interesting life. I have to say, after that, it got exceedingly Dutch. <laughs> and I think that, that's one thing. But look, I suppose my point and, and sort of comment is that uh, I think the trouble is with maths is it's not made lively enough. It's not made in, and a lot of people don't actually realise that it's an interpretation of the figures that have actually really got to, to go on. And that's what doesn't really happen. Um, so I don't know if there's any other sort of comments to back that up because I because uh, I find now when I'm doing manipulating figures and things, it's not okay you can do it, people can do reconciliations and come up with it. But it's actually what is behind it, why is that that figure what it is? Yeah. And that's what really needs to, to happen. Thank you. Can I yes, Richard? I want to say who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So Richard Stewart, I'm a liveryman of the company of Welshman Computer Management Consultants. Um, in my work, I focus on recruitment and I recruit people for lots of different companies in the management consultancy mm -hmm. sector and in the industry as well. I used to be a management consultant myself. Um, what I'm interested in understanding is, with the government's changes around education and deregulation and the setting up of free schools mm -hmm. and the funding and support that they can get from the private sector, um, why are not corporates actually interested in taking a lead in this matter and saying, well, we know that we need these people, we know that our needs have changed. They can actually play an important role in shaping <coughs> some of the education and taking a lead in this matter, I would call. Could I maybe comment on a couple of these? Those? Um, that's a very interesting, perhaps, tie a couple of those together. Um, I mean, I think one central theme here is how, how does change, how can change be made to happen? in this country. Um, one of the problems is we've got the linchpin, sadly, of assessment. And the problem with assessment is it sort of stops the ecosystem of education changing. Because you can't change the assessment because if you change the assessment then somehow you've got to get all the teachers on board and the government on board and everybody else on board before you change it. In fact, I wrote a blog post not too long ago about um, innovation-led evidence versus evidence-led innovation. So one of the problems we've got in education is that you can't make a change until you've got the evidence it works. Another problem I think we've got is I think there's gen there is confusion centrally, even amongst sort of engineering companies and you know, people who apply maths about exactly what it is that maths is doing for them, even though they're, they're people who sort of should know them, and as in the professors of engineering and things like that, but there, isn't, there hasn't been a very clear message about what it is we need and how we want to change that, which is <clears throat> some of what we're trying to do. So, uh, looping back to how, how we might change it, I mean, I think, it, to me, the public have got to lead the politicians on this one. This is not one where the politicians are going to stand up and say, we've got a new theory in this will somehow go. And the public needs several things. I think it means the people who are the users of mathematics 
which is, you know, organizations, <coughs> corporations, universities who get the people which don't have enough maths coming out of school. And I think that the more we can form groups that really drive that, um, will and get that message directly to the public. The politicians will then slowly follow and they've got the cover of that to follow. Um, we are also working with people like PISA, the international organization. I mean, what they do effectively is they put these international... So, of course, does everyone know what PISA is and what it does? Maybe you should just perhaps say what Yeah, so, so PISA is an OECD organization. That does metrics across the world for how well the educational systems are working. England, UK versus Germany versus you know China or Shanghai versus Estonia versus Finland. In maths, English, and various other subjects. Now, what that does is, it, it, at the moment the PISA results come out, you know, all the government ministers go and sort of run around saying, oh, you know, we went down because of this, or we went up because of this, and it's it's cover for them to make changes or not to make changes. So therefore, getting PISA to adjust what they consider maths to be is a long-term goal that I think will help. Um, the other thing I think is important is to try and get some countries on side, sadly ahead of this one, small ones like Estonia, so that then this one can have cover saying, oh, somebody else tried it first. But those are my thoughts, and I'd, I'd love any more thoughts on how those changes can happen. May I just build on that a little bit? I think there's a, another thing which is incredibly related and that is the grades versus subjects debate. So in the work I'm doing with the Your Life campaign, which is the 14 to 16 year olds encouraging um, kids to take maths and science, it's a sponsor by the government, but interestingly, to a point, paid for by industry. So eight major industries are our funding for that particular activity. One of the things that we've identified there is if we could change the subjects versus grades debate, it would be game changing. So if we could say, if we all sat around at dinner parties saying, my kids are all doing maths, instead of my kids have all got A grades, that would be game changing. Because actually, I that word again, I? I must stop using it. Um, but the point is that at the moment what happens is, the teachers, the schools, the children, and us flaming parents are all geared up to say it's <coughs> grades that matter. The stupid thing about it is, we know from an employment perspective, we know from a career enjoyment perspective, that actually subject is much more important than grades. So we've all got some accountability in trying to change that debate. And I really think the day when we all sit around at a dinner party saying, the great news is that my kid did maths, physics and chemistry, and when somebody says, and what grades did they get? I say, the great news is they got BCC, but they'll have a fabulous career because actually they've got the right subjects to do what this country needs and what they will get satisfaction out of. I think that will make a difference. Terrific. And that's a hard subject. Terrific. I see several hands going up. Yours was the earliest. So, um, yeah, so say I'm who David. you are. I'm David Pascal. I'm a guest at Ted Sankey tonight. Um, I've triggered a whole lot of sort of thoughts and these if sessions are always really stimulating. In 1990, I found myself, and you might wonder why, chairing the National Curriculum Council for the government. The 1988 before that introduced the National Curriculum and it was widely recognised when Kenneth Clark became Secretary of State that he was losing his way. And he made me chair. Now, that's a whole other story, much amazement to the effort of education. What I know about well, firstly, as a slight diversion, if you may remember, we were the National Curriculum Council, and that was the foremost body. Mm -hmm. SEAC, which was the Assessment Council, mm -hmm. was the sister council, but they came afterwards. We set the curriculum, and then somebody worked out what it was. Because what happened was, the curriculum, uh, the assessment began to drive the curriculum, and when they put the two things together, it became even more pronounced, and the curriculum was rather more cycle. That wasn't what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done about maths is, um, as chairman of the National Curriculum Council, we were the foremost advisors to the government on the curriculum. Again, my last one. And I was chairman. It wasn't because I was a mathematician. I mean, I was a chemical engineer by degree, so I quite like maths and it's quite good at it. But I remember the debate about the maths curriculum in 1990. And there was all these worthy people, sorry, uh, you know, the mathematicians. <laughs> and we were trying to decide, well, what should be the maths curriculum that we produce to ministers? 
And I could not get an understanding of the philosophical and the intellectual underpinning of the mass curriculum. Which is where, being an engineer trained, I wanted to start with that. You know, what's the intellectual underpinning of this curriculum? And the anecdote that I wanted to say, I said, I remember it vividly, I said at this meeting, well, I need these levels. Now, Pi, Pi is sitting, I can't remember quite, but Pi is sitting in level three. You know? Now, why is it in level three? And the answer was, oh, Chairman, well, if you'd like it in level four, we'll move it into level four. And I thought, that sums up that nobody, and I'm supposed to be counting on that, cannot find the underpinning, the philosophy. I'm sure there are five millions of highly academic intellectual people around the country that say they knew it, but I didn't know it. Nobody's advising me, I was advising ministers, and Pi ended up in whatever level it was in. <laughs> Great. Can I just make one point and then let others? Uh, this is a crucial point. One of the problems is nobody really knows what this curriculum should look like. They don't even know the outcomes. I've been searching around the world for an appropriate setup. Well, you know, after 10 years of learning this stuff, whatever it is, what is it that we're trying to achieve? So we've ended up writing our own outcomes tree, which in fact we've just been refining because we couldn't find it. And you know, in my view, you want the outcomes to which you're trying to, and some of them are things like confidence to tackle new problems. It's a matter, I mean, you know, if you don't have the confidence to look at a new problem, it's not much use to them. How do you manage the process of doing maths? We all know that if you're thrown, you know, you read the management book and you go and run a thousand person company, stuff comes up, it doesn't, it doesn't behave like the book. Well, the same happens in applying maths. You know, you look at the textbook maths, but when you actually apply it to the computer, it doesn't work quite right. So I think one of the problems is we've had mathematicians setting the maths curriculum. This is a mistake. Here's why I mean that, because, you know, if you look at, for example, purchases of mathematical, about 96% do not classify themselves as mathematicians. They're engineers, chemical engineers, actuaries. That is the balance that you would expect should be deciding what the curriculum for everyone is. But most governments would go to mathematicians, who actually often know very little about the application of mathematics in general life. So they tend to set a very pure subject, because they found it interesting in its own right, which doesn't actually meet the needs or the interests or the problem solving people want. I think that's a crucial thing that often goes wrong in virtually every country. Also, all the, the, a lot of the things you just mentioned, and a lot of the areas where those of us who use maths every day work are actually applied maths, one way or another. <coughs> Statistics is applied maths. Physics is applied maths, engineering is generally applied maths, you know, just taking the, the basics and applying them to the particular situation that, uh, that arises. I wasn't sure whether to add earlier on that my children all got A's in mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's the parents. So, good evening. I'm, I'm Drew Lacey, I'm a member of the Social Development Consultants. Um, I have six children. The youngest is 17 and the oldest I'm not going to tell you. Um, all of them are arts based or no, arts graduates. Not one of them did science uh, and they finished their maths at O level as we all had to do. Uh, the nuclear family has to be the focus for any real transformation or change when it comes in fact to the education of children. We all accept that, too much focus is put on educationists, on teachers, and sometimes we forget that very important point that change actually happens within families and is motivated in fact by families. And parents do care and they want to identify with the future and they want to know how they can change the lives of their children. And in my case, probably my grandchildren. Okay? Um, now, when it comes to economics, uh, it's a very interesting topic. Um, all sorts of books have been written, and one that I would recommend to anybody, in fact, to take you into this field of conceptual uh, approach and to apply it and to problem solving is free economics. Okay? That would have free maths. Okay? I think that what needs to be done is that you need to actually drill down from the level that we've, that we've had the presentation on here this evening to something, in fact, that can be presented in the form of literature that can actually go in, that can be understood by parents at large, it can be made fun, it can be visual, okay? We start with problems, we start with the real world, we look at the concepts that can therefore underpin 
an analysis of all of that reality. Okay? We start with what really will turn people on. That's where we need to start. We need to start with that, or we need to start with parents. If we're really going to engender the sort of change that we all want to be science. I'm going to ask us to pause on comments on that, because I think, first of all, we've got a limited number of minutes left. If you want to have some supper, it's not burnt. <laughs> and secondly, there are one or two people over here who would like to, to make a comment. Yes, I'm Kate Patchy, I'm a senior master at Westminster School. At Westminster School we have uh, 120 boys coming through from age 13, and of the 120, 114 chose to take maths A-level as one of the A-level subjects. Now I must admit that my heart sinks when I see such a high number taking maths A-level because I look at the vast array of wonderful subjects, classics, languages, the humanities, uh, the, the creative arts that people could take as one of those subjects. And why my heart sinks is because, to me, the most important thing is not taking mathematics as a subject, but being numerate. And I think everybody that graduates from our school should be consider themselves to be numerate and well equipped to work in, to operate in the modern world and to work in business and be successful in business with a high degree of numeracy and mathematical understanding, not necessarily having taken maths up to A level. So while, while I agree with uh, much of what you say about uh, making the maths curriculum the same more exciting, I think that mathematical <coughs> concept and numeracy should, should be part of um, every subject we study. So that if you study history, it doesn't mean it, it, you should be able to factor in very exciting mathematical concepts to help you in your study of history. Um, ditto languages, and so forth. And so it's more than, to my mind, just the maths curriculum that needs modifying and revolutionizing. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Steve, I think you have a few minutes. Um, Stephen Butchman, I'm, I'm a, a guest at David. Um, my background is, is mathematics, machine learning, so I'm, I'm a complete geek. Um, I have a 10 year old son who loves maths, and he studies maths in his own time. He's um, learning about geometry, probability theory, algebra, he's wanting to learn calculus. Um, he struggles with maths at school. Um, he's Dis he has dysgraphia, so he struggles to write quickly. So whilst he's very good at all of the abstract thinking around maths, when it comes to doing times tables in a test, when the teacher's reading out all of the questions, he's struggling to keep up writing. So uh, uh, he's doing maths, which is probably more advanced than his teacher at primary school, but at the same time, he's underperforming in the classroom. Okay. Um, so here we are. I'm Mark, a grad student at the school. Um, I heard a lot of people talking about problem solving, um, which, which is what maths gives you. Then, um, Mr. Wolfen also talked about how you know coding and um, maths together increases your problem solving ability. But what part aspects of maths would you emphasize? Um, would it be abstract, or would it be real life, or would it be a mixture? Because, I mean, not everyone can be an engineer. If you're an engineer, maybe you like do a certain type of engineering with a, like, like an abstract more than yeah. Or if you're a, just a normal person, you know, kind of... It's not new maths in the same line. Maybe um, abstract uh, thinking, for abstract thinking with problem solving is better because you can then uh, use innovative ways to that's a great question. Can I, can I just <coughs> deal with that for a moment? Because it's a really good question. Um, let's think of the best way you want. I mean, I, certainly the categories of maths that exist now, algebra, calculus, are crazy. I mean, they're just like, they don't really represent anything useful. I, I, the categories we started using are things like signal processing, uh, modeling, uh, Geometry, which I actually think is a modern as well as an old subject, um, architecture of maths, which is more to do with the insides, and uh, there's one and data science. But you could classify it various ways. I think perhaps what's more important is you need to know the tool set, as in, but not necessarily to know how to make the tools. I often say for DIY, you know, if you were told that basically your tool set is a hammer and you're not allowed to use a hammer until you've learned how to make it and 
similarly with a screwdriver. Mm -hmm. You get a rather limited tool set, and then most problems look like a nail, uh, which is what happens in Karamas. And I don't think the abstract thing, I think the abstract thinking sort of cuts across all of those different areas, but at sort of different levels. So the way we've been viewing it is still, it doesn't matter whether we're doing single processing or modeling, for example. There's a sort of layer of being able to read what other people have done and understand it. There's another layer of you being able to synthesize it yourself and to write new directions on top of that, which is sort of a harder level. And one of the things that gets wrong in maths at the moment is that because you have to go through the narrow pipe of hand calculating and building your tools for everything, those two get combined. I think people who are, let's say, 15, can happily read and rather learn to critique back to the point about critiquing what comes out of the computer, learn to critique rather complicated things that, that people who have gone much further up the educational level than they have at that point have written, have made. They may not be able to build this at that point, but they can critique it, they can get the computer to analyze. So I think those two need to be separate. So that, that's a sort of partial answer, but it's a great question which we're still thinking about how to solve. Maybe you should help us. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> One last question here and there. Uh, my name is Hugh Sappen Smith. Um, I'm one of those middle aged white males <coughs> who is completely unable to do maths from a computational perspective. But I use maths every day in my world. Um, I'm a sales and a marketeer, so I have to do it all the time. And your point about using the computer and getting that to do number crunching is absolutely wrong. But Two things that I think, if I may go back to my, the, the speaker previously who said, how do you crack this problem of getting maths to be exciting? How do you get education to be exciting? It's very simple. It's called hit the parents. We as parents are the most bigoted, misunderstood, misinformed group of people that you will ever come across. I sat in an interview not so long ago where I had a young lady in front of me who was on, I asked her what she wanted to do. And she said, my father wants me to become a doctor. For God's sake, fail me. Do not let me in. I do not wish to be a medical student. It is, that is the sort of thing that is happening time and time and time to our children. On a positive note, I think there is a way to solve this particular problem. We've just been handed it potentially by our government. It's called the apprentice levy. Business has just been handed a tool to actually utilize to change the world of education. We're being asked to pay for the apprentices. It's an old word. As a, histor as a historian, however, it's a brilliant word that we can use and change its meaning. If we take that particular opportunity, we can go to the educationalists and we can get hold of young people at an early age and introduce them to the real world and frame them in the real world. And business can then get much better raw talent to be able to use. Well, I think, I'm sorry, there, there are a number of people I know who would like to ask further questions. Mike Clark is getting very <coughs> agitated with that. <laughs> <laughs> But you also want to suffer. So I think we owe a real round of applause to Conrad and the team. And of course, as you sit down at your tables, you'll be able to pursue the conversations with those who are on your tables. Um, Simon, thanks to Simon, we have a, hopefully a record of what's been discussed. So we'll look at that and with the agreement of those who may turn out to be uh, part of the, of the scene. Uh, if you're interested, we'll try and produce something that you can take a look at. And then if you think there's something that we might do as a follow-up, um, I think the company will be very interested in understanding what that might be and who's interested in taking forward. Because there's clearly some collaborative opportunity here, which perhaps we could exploit. I'd certainly okay. be very interested to have ideas as to how we move this forward, get groups together, fund them, mm -hmm. build out topics and so forth. So yeah, if you have any ideas there would be great. Good. Thank you all. Come and have some tea. Thank you. Thank you.